at all of the Vedic cosmos. We begin our journey into Puranic cosmology in the spiritual realm. Krishna, the all-beautiful personality of Godhead, his associates and various forms belong in this blissful place. To accommodate those souls who voluntarily choose to go elsewhere, a dark cloud manifests. This is called the Muttatva or the material world. Krishna expands in the form of Kananda Dakshai Vishnu and lies within, upon the causal ocean. Innumerable Brahmandlas or universes emanate from his breathing. His glance upon the previously unmanifest energy activates the material nature personified as Durga Devi, and the personification of the glance itself is Lord Shiva. With Kananadakshai Vishnu's breathing in and out, the universes are created and annihilated. This is the basis of Kala, the time representative of Krishna that controls all aspects of the material manifestation. Now let's close in to focus on our Brandala universe. The first subtle element that each universe includes is false ego, inherited from the conditioned souls. Interestingly, it's about the size of our galaxy. Through various subtle and gross elemental interactions, the layer of ego condenses into intelligence, which then condenses into mind, then into the gross elements, ether, air, fire, water, and finally earth. Entering into the Hiranigarbha, Brahma's egg-shaped universe, Garbhadakshai Vishnu lies on the Garbhadaka ocean. A lotus stem emanates from his navel. The birth of Lord Brahma on the lotus flower is the secondary creation. The creation of realms in this universe are divided into 14 planetary divisions which are stacked vertically. Underneath them, dominating the bottom half of the universe, is the Garbhadaka ocean. Lord Brahma is also the origin of all life throughout the universe. Each following generation of his produces offspring which gradually occupy all the planetary levels below his realm. So humanoid beings, demigods, with various degrees of power can be found throughout the universe. The middle planetary systems, which includes the Earth, includes humans like us. But remember, we are not alone. The universe is dissected in half by a horizontal disk. Called Bhumandala, it includes many concentric circles named after various lands and exotic oceans, closing in. In the centre of Bhumandala is Mount Meru, which sits at the centre of the mountainous island of Jambudweep. Meru's height is nearly 800,000 miles above Jambudweep. On the top of Meru, we find an abode for Lord Brahma, and cities of the gods lie in eight directions. To Jambudweep south is Bharat Vash, a tract of land occupied by the conditioned souls engaged in fruitive work. We now journey through the higher realms. Situated above Bumandala and beyond our perceptive ability, beginning with Bhavaloka, the abode of Rakshasas and Upper Devas, and, level by level, passing over various heavenly regions, until we reach the topmost planet, Satchaloka, where Lord Brahma resides. The demigods, populating the more elevated regions, are empowered representatives of the Lord who have various universal functions. Delving below Bumandala to the lower regions, one encounters Bilgasvarg, seven subterranean worlds inhabited by Asuric beings. Below them are the hellish realms, where in the course of transmigration a person is subject to reconditioning before entering their next body. Back to the horizontal disk of Bumandala, 
The Babatum explains that the sun circumambulates Meru clockwise on its daily journey, like the spinning of a potter's wheel. However, it also talks about an annual counterclockwise motion of the sun relative to Brumandala. This is because the sun goes around the ecliptic counterclockwise once per year. The Bhagavatam resolves this seeming contradiction by describing the motion of ants on a potter's wheel. It compares the view of an observer on the wheel compared to an observer at the side of the wheel. So it acknowledges the movements of the sun in terms of relative points of view. Those of course are from earth-centered perspectives. This geocentric perspective is a feature which is used to describe the movements of the planets of the solar system. Remarkably, the dimensions of the inner concentric circles of Bumandala match the epicycle orbits of the inner planets. Mercury, Venus and Mars. The outer regions of Bumandala, the Golden Lands, corresponds to Jupiter and Saturn and the outermost edge corresponds to the orbit of Uranus. This relationship between Bumandala and the solar system is further supported by the fact that the various exotic oceans match the orbits of the planets, according to relative distances described in the Tidius Bode law. But that version is based on a sun-centered solar system, so both earth-centered and sun-centered views appear to be incorporated simultaneously. The furthest extent of Bumandala's dark region is 2 billion miles from Earth, as mentioned a distance just beyond that of Uranus. Yet the vertical axis of the Bumandala universe is said to contain millions of distant stars. At the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles a second, it would take two and a half hours to reach Uranus. From Earth, we are seeing the planet as it was no more than two and a half hours ago, no longer than most movies. But even the nearest stars to us are light years away, much further. So when it comes to reaching the stars, subtle, mystic ways of travel would be necessary to cross such distances. That would have to include a shift in space-time. Perhaps this is how pilots of ancient celestial viminas such as Maharaj Priyavata found the worlds with various exotic oceans. So, thanks for watching. Now, please share with others.